Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project and I welcome you to today's session, the Vaseline Healing Project uh, series, Medication Rashes. This is the third in a four part educational series pre presented by the Vaseline Healing Project and Maven Project in partnership with Direct Relief. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jeanette Okoye. She's a professor and chair of dermatology at Howard University College of Medicine. Her areas of clinical and research expertise are in um, continuous disorders that disproportionately affect people with pigmented skin, including scarring alopecia, Herodonta super superativa, uh, T cell lymphoma, and continuous SARC. Dosis, and I apologize for my mispronunciation, as well as health disparities in dermatology. Dr. Okoye earned her medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and completed her dermatology training at Yale University, where she also served as chief resident. It's a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with both Direct Relief and the Vaseline Healing Project, and here's a little bit more about each of our organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistant or assistance organization. Founded in 1948, Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. And lastly, the Va Vaseline continues providing access to care with Direct Relief, who has been an ongoing partner for over six years through the Vaseline Healing Project. This partnership helps to support a network of nonprofit health centers and clinics that provide affordable and comprehensive services to those who need it most. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Okoye. Um, please, you're free to begin whenever you'd like. Thank you, Kristen, and uh, hi, everyone. I will actually go off camera today because I had a bit of a scheduling snafu. So I'm in the airport. I'm at O'Hare. Hello, anybody in Chicago. Uh, so I'll go off just so that there's no distractions uh, behind me. So today we're going to talk about medication-induced rashes, or I'll call them drug rashes or drug eruptions interchangeably. And we'll start by just talking a little bit about the epidemiology and why they're important for us to know and the different types of cutaneous drug reactions and I'll frame them in sort of an immunologic perspective. I think there are different types of immune responses and there are different types of drug rushes that fall under each of those headings. So we'll, we'll frame it in that way. And then we'll discuss um, actually three cases of drug rushes that are a little bit different, a little bit interesting, and you might see them on the outpatient side. I won't focus a lot on the inpatient drug rashes, like toxic epidermal necrolysis, because you know I think in your setting, you may not see that very often, but we will talk about tips and tricks to recognize that early and send those patients to the hospital. Okay, so let's start by talking about the types of medication reactions. There are two types. The first are um, non-immunologic reactions. So these are basically reactions from the pharmacologic action of the drug. So for example, if you give someone too much beta blocker, they're gonna have bradycardia. And that's pretty predictable. Um, it, sh it should happen reliably in almost any patient and the severity is usually dose dependent. So the more beta blocker they get, the lower their, their heart rate, so to speak. But what we'll be focused on today is really the immunologic reactions. And a great example of that is an allergic drug rash. These are unpredictable. You cannot tell which patient will get a drug rash and which won't. You can't tell which medicine, what dose, how long they've been on it. Um, so they really are uh, impossible in some ways to predict. There are people who are at higher risk and we'll talk about them, but other than that, they are all unpredictable. And these reactions can occur in really any organ system, but the skin is one of the more common organs uh, affected. And why is this important? So medication reactions on the skin occur in about 1% of drug trials, uh, clinical trials on, on all medications. That's not insignificant. And in about 5% of trials of antibiotics and anticonvulsants, these are two of the big players when it comes to 
drugs that cause trouble on the skin. And it occurs in about 3% of hospitalized patients because we give lots of medications in the hospital. Sometimes we give medications that interact with each other and increase your chances of having a reaction. And then the incidence of fatalities due to drug reactions um, among inpatients is about 0.10%, so not insignificant. And there was a nice study done a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, at this point. They looked at 15,000 patients on an inpatient service, and about 3% of those patients had drug rashes. And the most common rash was a maculopapular rash, or it's called a, also called a morbilliform rash or measles like rash. When we think drug rash, that's usually the one we're thinking about. So we'll talk about that one today. And the most common drugs implicated in all of the drug rashes that they saw in this hospital, I think, was in Boston. The penicillins were number one, and they still are. The sulfonamides, especially Bactrim. You tell a dermatologist that you're giving somebody Bactrim, and we all cringe because it's like something's bound to happen at some point. Uh, NSAIDs are a big culprit, and that's really interesting and kind of scary because they are over the counter, and often patients do not consider them "quote unquote" medications. It's just something I take for headaches occasionally, but they come up time and time again. Uh, anticonvulsants and antiretrovirals are also on the list of the most troublesome medications, and actually, these latter two often cause the worst types of drug rashes. So, when a patient is on one of these, uh, actually, I would add allopurinol to that list of kind of bad actors. If they're on one of these and they have a drug rash, I actually interact with them a little bit differently. And we'll talk about that. So risk factors for developing drug rashes, remember I said it's hard to tell, it's hard to predict. But in general, older patients are more likely to have drug rashes, maybe because they're more likely to be on more medicines. Um, certainly polypharmacy just increases your risk. And interestingly, immune dysregulation. So patients who are immunosuppressed, especially patients with HIV, are more likely to get drug rashes. Um, and in fact, if a patient has HIV, they're more likely, they're 10 to 50 times more likely to get a drug rash to Bactrim than someone who's HIV negative. So again, Bactrim, yikes, and almost at some point, most of our patients with HIV were on Bactrim prophylaxis. And so we were running into these rashes pretty often. Okay, so let's dive into these immunologic types of drug rashes. And we talked about this in the early carrier lecture a few months ago, where we have four different types of immune responses. And there are different drug rashes that fall into each of these types of immune responses. And let's, you know, we'll go through them systematically. So type one, this is your IgE dependent type of immune response. Usually you have some kind of antigen or allergen, food, pollen, in this case, we're talking about medications that induce formation of IgE antibodies. They bind to your mast cells and then they release a ton of histamine. And the histamine is what's driving the symptoms of swelling, itching, patients get hives or urticaria, and they can get angioedema and they can get anaphylaxis. This one happens really quickly, uh, unlike most drug rashes. It happens within hours, uh, and it's actually not the most common type of drug rash. Um, as we talked about, the maculopapular rash is the most common type. This isn't that common, thankfully, because it could be pretty scary because it moves so fast, and you don't know if that patient with hives is going to go on to develop angioedema problems, breathing problems, you know, their tongue swelling, and so on. And so just some photos of what um, what this could look like. It just looks like classic hives. Um, the secret with hives is to ask the patient if the spots are coming and going over a course of 24 hours. If any individual spot is there for more than 24 hours and you're not looking at classic urticaria or classic hives, and so it's probably not a drug rash. But um, And then the, the patient on the right is just an example of angioedema caused by cephalosporin. Now, if we all think back to school, one of the things they tested us on a lot was ACE inhibitors and angioedema. ACE inhibitors can cause angioedema, but it's not an immune response. It's not an allergic response. It's caused by bradykinin, so it's a different non-immunologic response. So we won't talk about that today. So back to our type 1 uh, reactions. One clue is that they're very, very itchy. Um, and the most common causes are antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, Bactrim, and interestingly, minocycle, which probably don't use a ton, except for us, we use it in the setting of acne, uh, but, but antibiotics are the most common culprits here. 
really with all of these uh, drug rashes, the way we diagnose this is just by taking a really good clinical history in terms of when did the rash first start? What medications are you taking? And when I ask patients, what medications are you taking after they're done telling me, I said, what, what else? And then I say, what else? A couple more times because people forget. And then I ask, what over-the-counter medications are you taking? I really call that out separately because patients don't always think of that as medications. And then when they're done with that list, I then ask by name, what about Tylenol? What about ibuprofen? What about Advil, Motrin? I call them out separately uh, because, again, patients just aren't thinking about them as drugs that could be related to, the, to what's going with them. Aleve, naproxen, I, I get way in the weeds because these are usually the culprits. Uh, there, there's a RAST allergy test that exists for the penicillins um, and, and cephalosporins because they're so common. They so commonly have this IgE presentation. So you could send a patient for allergy testing, but usually uh, you can uh, tell with this type of reaction because it happens so quickly, you can usually pinpoint which drug they got in the past, say, 24 hours. So treatment, you withdraw the medication, of course, and these patients generally do well with antihistamines. So you have non-sedating antihistamine, ricoloridine, fexofenidine, and you could do that one or even two times a day. And then we'll also give them a sedating antihistamine for breakthrough itching, which they might need for the first day or two. We can go as high as 15 milligrams of Benadryl or hydroxyzine, which I think works really, really well. It really knocks people out, but hydroxyzine anywhere from 10 to 25 milligrams every uh, six to eight hours or so. And they will eventually, you know, in a two or three days, they usually turn a corner. And then our type two reaction. So type one is your IgE mediated, fast onset hives. Type two is a cytotoxic reaction where you, the patient forms antibodies against a specific cell type. So there's something in that medication that reminds the immune system of that cell type. And so you make antibodies against that and it leads to destruction of that cell type. Uh, and that could be, the cell type could be a red cell, in which case the patient would get a drug-induced hemolytic anemia. It could be a platelet in which case the patient will get a drug-induced thrombocytopenia. And so here's a, an example of a patient with a drug-induced thrombocytopenia. They'll basically get petechiae. They'll behave as though they don't have any platelets. Um, so they'll get uh, petechiae with very minimal trauma. Uh, if you check their blood pressure, that's a really good test. You check their blood pressure. Once the blood pressure cuff squeezes their upper arm, they're going to get a shower of petechiae within a few minutes. Um, they might have petechiae on mucosal surfaces like the lip or and on the palate uh, just from, from minor trauma. And, you know, the, the signs and the symptoms really for this type really depend on which tissue is involved, which organ is involved. And, you know, as we talked about, if it's uh, drug-induced thrombocytopenia, which we'll talk about in one of our cases, the platelets are the target, so that's what you see. And the most common cause of the drug-induced thrombocytopenia, and I'm focused on that one because that one has a skin manifestation. Uh, NSAIDs are up there, uh, furosemide, again, penicillins and sulfonamides are on there. And interestingly, statins um, are, it's not common, but certainly happens um, that we, we, we've seen it. Um, in treatment, same thing, you withdraw the drug and you just monitor their platelet count, replete, you know, transfuse platelets if needed and try to avoid trauma as far as possible. These patients aren't usually at risk for like a GI bleed or, or a, a intracranial hemorrhage or anything like that, but you do want to watch them. And within a couple of days of stopping the medicine, their platelet count starts to recover. And within a week, it's usually fully recovering. So now we have our type three type of immune response. That's the immune complex uh, dependent reactions. And in this one, antibodies bind to the drug or the antigen, and they form these big immune complexes in the blood, and then they get deposited in, in different organs and cause the symptoms. In this case, they can get uh, deposited in the blood vessels, and that causes a drug-induced vasculitis. So here's a uh, photo of a patient with a drug-induced vasculitis. It usually starts on the lower legs. Uh, they have purpura, meaning when you press on the redness, it does not blanch away. And it's often palpable. So if you have, if you see someone with purpura, right, redness that's not blanching, 
you have to run your hands over it. If you can't feel anything, that is, then it's probably just a bruise or ecchymosis you bled into the skin. But if you can feel that, if it's what we call palpable purpura, then you're very concerned about vasculitis. And this is a type three uh, reaction. The most commonly implicated drugs, again, are frenzy antibiotics, sort of a bigger spread of antibiotics that really, um, can cause this uh, vasculitis, sulfonamides, furosemide. Uh, here comes one of our anticonvulsants, phenytoin. And then TNF alpha inhibitors. That one, I, I'm calling that one out because so many, I think so many of my patients are on TNF alpha inhibitors for psoriasis or hydradenitis. Um, and they can get a drug-induced vasculitis from that. So of course you would draw the drug, but these patients usually need systemic steroids because the vasculitis can affect the skin, but it can also, and usually does, affect other organs, the liver, the kidneys, the thyroid. Sometimes they get a myocarditis as well. And so we want to monitor them uh, for, for drug, for internal organ involvement, even weeks after they've stopped the medicine. And then finally, we have our type four reaction, which is your delayed type hypersensitivity reaction that we usually associate with like a PPD uh, reaction. Uh, but in this one, your immune system sees an antigen, right? it sees the drug. And then when it's exposed to the drug again, it, it creates these memory T cells. Uh, I'm sorry, with the first exposure, it decides that it wants to create these memory T cells. It doesn't like the drug for some reason. And then when you subsequently get exposed to the drug, those T cells migrate to the skin and release all these cytokines and you get itching and swelling and you get this rash. And usually it's the maculopapular regular drug rash that we kind of all think about. But there are other types. Uh, there's something called a fixed drug eruption, and then there's a lichenoid drug rash. And I'll show you some pictures of that. They are all in this type four reaction category. And because your immune system has to create these memory T cells, this rash doesn't usually occur very quickly. It usually occurs seven to 14 days after you've taken the drug. So these are a little bit tougher because most people don't necessarily remember a drug that they took for say three days, two weeks ago, but uh, the kind of the drug history is really, really important in this case. So here's an example of someone with a maculopapular or morbilliform drug rash. Morbilliform means measles-like, it's kind of what it looks like. It starts usually on the trunk and extends towards the face and the arms. Um, this is a patient who had a, a morbilliform drug rash to the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. This is from the literature. So you can see just little macules and papules. They're usually itchy, not, not terribly itchy, not as bad as urticaria. Um, and these patients are not usually systemically ill, so they feel okay, but they might be a little bit miserable just from the rash. And then I mentioned this drug-induced lichenoid drug rash or basically drug-induced lichen planus. Um, and here's a patient from the literature with these widespread <clears throat> lichen planus-like lesions that usually, again, start on the trunk and then work their way out. These can be incredibly itchy. Uh, this one was from imatinib, uh, but we see this from sometimes hydrochlorothiazide, which is very ubiquitous drug. Uh, and we sometimes see patients show up and they've had a diagnosis of lichen planus, but really what it is, is they're reacting to their um, hydrochlorothiazide. Um, the thing about the, the lichenoid drug eruption, they can actually get involvement of their oral mucosa, which it becomes important when we talk about the severe drug rashes in a little bit. But what's really crazy about these is they can occur months after you've started the drug, which makes it hard to think of that drug. We're all sort of focused on the immediate past couple of weeks when people come in with what we think is a drug rash. But in this case, if you see someone with lichen planus or it kind of looks like lichen planus, think about their entire medication list. And if they're on any of these drugs in bold here, hydrochlorothiazide, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, which you know, everybody's on those, statins, or if they take NSAIDs with some regularity, PPIs with some regularity, then think about trying to peel away one of those medications at a time to see if it will um, improve. The downside is it takes weeks to months to improve. Um, so it, it, this, this could be a really tricky. So in the meantime, while we're trying to ascertain which medication will treat patients like this with systemic steroids, sometimes we'll do IM Kenalog. So 
an intramuscular injection of say 80 milligrams of Kenalog, where it just has a depot in the muscle and then very slowly releases some steroid to help them with just quality of life. The itching is so bad. Um, and to do phototherapy for them in the meantime while we're figuring out um, the medication. And in case you're curious, one way we try to ascertain if someone has lichen planus versus a lichen planus like drug rash is one, we look for the drug list, but we also do a biopsy. And if on biopsy you see a lot of eosinophils, then that's not typically a cell we associate with lichen planus, but it is typically a cell we associate with allergic type of reaction. So we do a, a biopsy and we see lots of eosinophils and this lichenoid pattern are really suspicious about uh, drug. So those are the four sort of categories. It's, like, it's just a way to categorize the drug rashes um, in your mind. I feel like you guys are, you know, I always say I like to do Derm 201 with you all because I think you probably have seen enough maculopapular rashes. You didn't need to learn about that today. I wanted you to know that there are so many different types and I want you to have a way to categorize them in your head. And then this is another uh, sort of pro tip I want to leave you with, just some drug rash principles to keep in mind. Basically, you have to suspect, to me, you should suspect any new onset rash of, of being a drug rash. That should be on your differential, especially if the rash started on the trunk and moved outwards. So you ask about any medications in the past two weeks. As I said before, really get in the weeds about the over-the-counter medications because you don't necessarily think about them. Um, ask about supplements, ask about herbal remedies. Did they travel and bring medicine back, which happens quite a bit in our immigrant populations in DC. Even if the patient has taken the drug before with no reaction, it could still be related. And sometimes that's hard to get patients buy-in because they say, I've been taking this my entire life. It's like, well, that's kind of how it works. You have to have taken it before in order to have an allergic response. So let's say you do suspect a drug rash question is, how worried should you be? So you want to ask yourself the following questions or ask the patient, is the skin itchy or is it painful? Itchy is par for the course with a drug rash. That's okay. But pain is a very bad sign. Skin pain means that the skin is dying. It's necrosing. It's not getting enough blood supply or it's detached from the dermis beneath it. And so at that point, you should be concerned for things like Stevens Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, or an impending vasculitis should be heightened. I would send that patient to the ED, preferably if there's one with the access to dermatology or a burn unit, because they will need wound care when, not if, when their skin sloughs off. Because if your skin is painful, it is dying. And when it's dead, it will just fall off and leave behind denuded skin. And those patients get into trouble very, very quickly. And we give them systemic steroids and supportive care until they're better. So after you ask that question, your next question is, does the patient have any mucosal symptoms? So are their eyes red? Are their eyes itchy or gritty? Do they have dysuria? Do they have oral pain or ulcers? Do they have erosions, ulcers or testing on the lips? Mucosal involvement is a bad sign. Again, it points towards Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Send them to the ED. They need access not just to dermatology, but to ophthalmology. Uh, because if we don't intervene very quickly with patients who have eye involvement, they can develop synechiae and scarring um, on the conjunctiva that can lead to blindness. They need systemic steroids. They need IV fluids. They might need parenteral nutrition if they can't eat. Um, and especially if they're presenting to you, it's just been a couple of days, you know that by tomorrow, it's going to be worse. They need help ASAP. The third question is, does the patient have a fever? Or do they have any other systemic symptoms? Are their joints hurting, abdominal pain? Do they just look poorly, right? They have a minimal rash but they don't look good. They don't look like they're, they're, they look sick. That is another bad sign. It's concerning for, there's a drug rash called dress syndrome where patients get, it's called drug reaction with systemic symptoms. They get liver involvement, thyroid involvement, uh, bad, bad, bad. And then of course our friends, Stephen Johnson syndrome and TN, they need to sell it. So let's say you don't have access uh, to the ED or you're gonna be the one managing this patient or any of the ones I mentioned before, 
steroids, steroids, steroids. IV solumedrol will be great. A gram in divided doses over 24 hours for about three days, and then a slower taper of prednisone. Um, you really just want to hit that inflammatory response with a hammer so that it will stop or at least slow down. If you don't have access to IV solumedrol, then prednisone high dose, close to a milligram per kilogram uh, of ideal body weight, not actual body weight. That usually works out to about 80 or 100 milligrams of prednisone a day for three days. And then you slowly taper by 10 milligrams every three days. Uh, they need baseline renal, liver, cardiac, thyroid function testing. And actually it needs to be repeated every few weeks for the next six months, because sometimes like the thyroid and the myocarditis, the effects of these systemic drug rashes can occur many months after they, their skin has recovered. So if the answer to all of these questions is no, then likely what you're looking at is like an urticarial drug rash or a maculopapular or mobiliform drug rash. We can manage that. We talked about this already. You stop the drug, you give them some antihistamines. Um, for the maculopapular rash in particular, you can do some um, uh, topical steroids, give them a nice big one pound jar of triamcinolone cream, and they can apply that twice a day for a couple of weeks. I say use a big jar because generally they have involvement in lots of places and you don't want to give them a little tube and they run out quickly. One of the things about a maculopapular rash, it is in general benign enough that if a medication is short term and absolutely necessary, you can treat through, quote unquote, this rash. Meaning, let's say we have two or three more days to go of like an antibiotic course that you've been trying to get the UTI under control or they have a pneumonia or something. If we can just give them these topical steroids and uh, antihistamines for the next two, three days and finish up the course, then that's reasonable sometimes. It's just about the risk and the benefit. If the risk of stopping the drug is more than the risk of the drug rash in this case, then uh, sometimes that's reasonable. Now, if the answer to the questions, right, itchy, painful, mucosal symptoms and fever, if the answer to, that, to those questions is no, but the patient is on an anticonvulsant, allopurinol or an antiretroviral, that ups the ante for me. I would still stop the drug and I would consider using systemic steroids anyway in these patients because chances are if one of those drugs is involved, uh, things can go bad pretty quickly. So you just monitor them over the next few days. Okay, we're about to start some cases, but there's an alarm going off behind me. Can you all hear that? If not, I'll keep going. It, it's a little awkward. It kind of has like a little echo <laughs> in the background. Are you hearing the alarm? Nope, we're good now. I can hear it. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's move on to our cases. Uh, we have three cases. The first is a 37-year-old woman. She develops these multiple round red macules and patches and they very quickly turn kind of dusky and hyperpigmented. She has no medical history. She said she takes no medicines every day, but she took one dose of fluconazole a day before the spots appeared. And then you know, patients that she had a similar rash in the past, and when she's got them in the past, it leaves behind these dark marks, and then the dark marks stay forever. And on further questioning, the rash seems to occur after she has fluconazole because she gets these infections relatively frequently. Now, this is actually a patient I saw in residency. And so she came for that one spot, but then when we really looked at her head to toe, you could see around her mouth, this dark area that was from a previous uh, episode. You can see this darker spot that I'm circling with my arrow here. That was from a previous episode. And then there's a really dark one of her neck uh, down here that's a little bit out of focus. And then when we really got her undressed, we saw multiple of these uh, spots from previous uh, you know, interactions with fluconazole. Palms and soles were clear, and she had no mucosal involvement, even the back of her hands. The, and this is from years and years of getting this rash periodically. So this is a nice example of a fixed drug eruption. Usually, in fixed drug eruption, patients develop one or just a few very round, um, red, or, or just getting swollen plaques, and they eventually get very dark. 
but in some patients, they can be multiple and they can be pretty widespread. That's not common, though. The most common is, is just one spot. And every time they encounter that drug, it comes back in the same spot over and over. One of the things about fixed drugs, because of the histology of it, because of the way the immune system behaves in this, in this condition, it leaves behind very impressive, deep hyperpigmentation, and that lasts for years. Um, which is what bothers patients more than anything else. After the first exposure to the offending drug, lesions develop in about one to two weeks, but with subsequent exposures, they appear really, really quickly. So kind of like hives, this one happens usually within a day or two. And usually when they re-administer the drug, it comes back in the same location. Um, now, one of the things that helps us identify fixed drug is that deep pigmentation, but there's one drug that causes a non-pigmenting fixed drug, which is Sudafed, so that's sort of an outlier. Um, and patients always often come saying, oh, this might be a spitter bite, or um, sometimes they'll be misdiagnosed as having erythema multiformis. But the most common drugs associated with fixed drug, Bactrim is a big one, naproxen in particular, but other NSAIDs can as well. Those are the two big ones. Even Tylenol, which isn't implicated in many drug rashes, but can certainly be a cause of fixed drug, and fluconazole, and then pseudofed or pseudoephedrine, as I mentioned, can cause a fixed drug, but it's not dark, it's just usually kind of pink. And the most common locations for fixed drug, the genital area, around the mouth, and you saw that patient had a really nice lesion around her mouth, and on the hands, uh, which uh, she had. I'm highlighting naproxen, acetaminophen, and pseudoephedrine, again, because they're over the counter. So if you didn't ask, probably wouldn't figure it out. Uh, here's one of my patients who has one spot up here on the right upper lip, and then she had a larger spot on the chin from two separate um, instances of naproxen. So the fixture, I won't belabor you with the immunology. It's, it's really interesting stuff where you get this um, the type four reaction, it's mediated by these cytotoxic CD8 cells. And the sensitization for fixed drug occurs actually preferentially with intermittent use of a medicine, not continuous use. So it's not going to be caused by your hypertension medicine that you take every day. It's going to be caused by that thing that you take once a month for like a headache, you know, like, like ibuprofen or fluconazole for occasional um, infections. And so what happens is those CDA T cells, they go and they live right in that spot in the skin. So every time you take the drug, they just reactivate right in that specific uh, spot. And so we can do patch testing um, to determine if somebody has a fixed drug eruption by applying a very dilute concentration of that drug on the spot uh, of the previous eruption to see if you can basically wake it back up. All right, so treatment, again, you try to avoid that drug. It's usually not something that's necessary. It's, you can hopefully find an alternative for them to use intermittently for, for whatever reason they needed that uh, intermittent medicine. And then if they have widespread disease, you could consider either oral or topical steroids, but um, it's not usually necessary. And then you can have to prepare the patient for the fact that this pigmentation will last a really long time. All right, our second case now. So this is a 72-year-old woman. She's in the MICU. She had a, an MI and then very quickly started developing redness all over her body and pustules everywhere. She'd been hospitalized for the past 10 days. And this is a kind of typical situation in the hospital, right? We get called on day 10, but on days one to seven, she had vancomycin. On day four, she got some bacteria, we're not sure why. On day five, they stopped it. And then on day seven, they stopped the vancomycin, added ceftriaxone. Then she started getting a rash on day nine. So Derm was called on day 10, and now we have to figure out, okay, which of these drugs is the most likely culprit? So with this patient, she's had low-grade fevers. She doesn't feel that great. She's a little itchy. And she has a white count, and she's neutrophilia, and she has eosinophilia. So these patients get pretty tricky because here she's in the hospital, and she has a white count with a neutrophilia. So the team is saying, well, she's infectious. We need to give her more antibiotics. And we're saying, stop the antibiotic. She has eosinophilia. This is a drug rash caused by the antibiotic. So it's always like this big, big fight between German and internal medicine. With, with these patients. But if I had to guess which of the medicines were, uh, were at play in this patient, if she developed a rash on day nine, chances are it's the vancomycin. 
because that's within that seven to 14 day window. Yes, she got some back trim, but it was just one day. It was DC four days before she got the rash, unlikely. And then the cephalaxone she got just two days before she got the rash, so unlikely. So that's kind of how we go through and try to figure out which drug is at play. So vancomycin is what we blamed for this drug rash. And this is an interesting, and it's it's common enough, but I mean, hopefully this is, uh, you're learning something about this one. This is called Egypt or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis where patients get this bright red um, erythema if they have lighter skin and darker skin it's not always red uh, but they get sheets and sheets of pustules so you can imagine it's hard for me to convince somebody that this is not infection so this is these are sterile pustules there are no bacteria in them they usually start either on the face or in the flexural areas, like under the armpits or in the anticubital fossa. So these are the clues we're looking for to tell us, okay, is this age up or is this really an infection? And it's usually relatively quick, usually about two to three days after you get the drug. And some patients have a fever, neutrophilia, and about 30% have eosinophilia as well. So you can see why it gets confusing, but it's basically because, well, we'll talk about the immunology. Basically, the the, there are cytokines that are calling neutrophils um, to the skin. So the pustules, they last about a week, and it's usually followed by pretty impressive desquamation. So the skin is sort of peeling off. It's not peeling off like Stephen's Johnson's, where it's the peel is, the split is deep in the skin. This is just basically after the pustule goes away, the very superficial parts of the skin sort of peel off. But it's pretty impressive when patients get worried. And sometimes the teams in the hospital get worried that um, it's a new rash, but it's really just the HF getting better. Uh, common culprits are penicillins and cephalosporins. I'm sorry, I misspoke. In this case, it was not the vancomycin. It was the cephalosporin because we, it was started within two days of the rash developing and HF happens quickly. Sorry about that. So for her, it was the cephalosporin. Uh, but you can see Tylenol is on this list. And actually, I've seen a couple of those um, Tylenol. Uh, here's a picture of that desquamation that you see after age up. Um, and the skin's just sort of peeling off, but it's everywhere. It's all over the bed sheets, and patients get worried. Um, and here's what I was mentioning with the immunology of age up. It's interesting. These T cells secrete a lot of IL 8, a specific cytokine that activates and recruits neutrophils. So you get a ton of neutrophils coming to the skin, and so they make pustules. That's what neutrophils do. Uh, but it's not infection, even though it looks like it. And here's a patient with brown skin. You can see that impressive redness isn't there, but all those little yellowish dots there are all pustules, sheets and sheets of it. And if you look in the underarm area here, you can see there are even more, there are more pustules in that area because that's where it started. That's a really good clue for this drug. So, Similar to the others, we usually have to use clinical history. Biopsy can help, but you should, if you wait two or three days for, your, for a biopsy and you kept the patient on the medicine, then they're just going to keep getting worse. Um, so we try to do it by clinical history, try to stop as many medications as we can safely, and then do the biopsy. Uh, you could do patch testing a few weeks after they recover you know, with small concentrations of the drug. If you're really in a bind, you know, it's really important to know if somebody's allergic to Tylenol or allergic to vancomycin, uh, as they might need it in the future. So we'll do patch testing if we can. They just need supportive care. I uh, just want to prepare them for the desquamation and you know give some emollients, moisturizers, um, because this gets better very, very quickly, no systemic issues. And then our final case is a five-year-old girl. Um, I'll never forget this case. She was given a 10-day course of spectrum for MRSA at her local urgent care center. And on day seven, she developed this purple, basically on her lip and on her tongue and her heart felt. And then about 12 hours later, she started getting petechiae, according to her mom, little red dots all over her arms, and we just didn't know what's going on. She was fine otherwise. They went back to the urgent care, and the urgent care sent them home and said, you know, she's fine, just see her pediatrician uh, next week. It was on a weekend. But the parents were really uneasy. It was just one of those times when I really felt deep respect for um, her mom's like, intuition. They just couldn't rest. She was fine, eating, talking, doing everything, but they just felt like something was off. And they drove three hours to Hawkins 
uh, to the ED. And so we, wanted, we want somebody to see us. We don't know what's going on. So we saw her. We saw in the middle of the night, we saw uh, these uh, ecchymoses and then we heard of this uh, history of Bactrim for MRSA and we diagnosed her basically with a drug-induced thrombocytopenia. We checked her CDC and her platelet was zero. And so she was hospitalized. Um, I think they were just worried that, you know, as a kid, she would have some trauma and, and bleed. Uh, but we stopped the drug. And within two days, she had 20. You know, platelet count was 20. And within a day after that, it was 70. And very, very quickly, um, she got better. And so this, as we talked about before, is just platelet destruction by the by drug antibodies, basically. It occurs about a week or two after exposure, just like many of the other drug rashes. Some people then have a stack in addition to the PPI and so forth. Bad bleeding and the GI is a lot less common. And sometimes there are there are tests for some drug dependent antibodies, but um, most times I don't think you need it. Usually it's one of these common drugs like Bactrim, ibuprofen, here's that inset again, uh, some of the antibiotics and one of the antifungosums. So for her, uh, we just switched through it. As I mentioned, she recovered pretty quickly and these patients usually do. But if you needed to infuse, uh, to infuse with platelets, you can, IVIG could be helpful as well, and even systemic steroids, but not usually necessary. All right, so in summary, uh, the immunologically mediated drug rashes and more significant morbidity, and in some cases, mortality, and polypharmacy uh, really can make identifying the offending drug difficult. And remember that many over-the-counter drugs can cause drug rashes. Tylenol, NSAID, pseudoephedrine, don't discount them if you're taking the history. Early recognition, withdrawal of the drug, that's actually the most important piece of treatment. And sometimes uh, it's fun to basically usurp this aberrant immune response to help us identify the offending drug by doing patch testing or looking for the drug antibodies, um, which is what we do on the outpatient side after the patient has improved. And so with that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Okoye. That was fantastic. Uh, first question. Oh, just a reminder, if you do have a question, please put them in the Q&A box or use the raise hand feature to speak directly to Dr. Okoye. First question. When there is a history of food allergy, which foods are associated with increased risk of reaction to which groups of medications or latex? Question. I think there aren't that many correlations between food allergies and medication allergies that I can think of. Um, there are some reports of what's called a systemic allergic contact dermatitis, meaning uh, people who might be allergic to, say, uh, like ragweed, depending on if they take like a tea with chamomile. Sometimes they'll have this there's an overall kind of systemic response to the chamomile, which I guess you could consider a drug rash. Uh, but but otherwise, I can't think of, of a correlation there. With latex, I think there's some fruits like, uh, like banana, kiwi, that you can have sort of an oral allergy to those drugs if you have a latex allergy. But in terms of them causing a full body drug rash, like the ones we've been talking about, not that I know of. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Oh, I lied. If the transport of a patient with Stevens Johnson from a rural clinic that doesn't have a, uh, sorry, parenteral cortisol, <laughs> doctor, boy, they're giving fancy words, uh, parenteral corticosteroid to a higher yeah, level of care. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So the question is, if, if the patient, um, the patient has Stephen Johnson um, and they need like systemic steroids, they need a higher level of care, but the care is delayed by weather, et cetera, should you give an oral dose? Yes, yes. I would give a nice big dose of 80 or 100. No one would fault you for that, um, just, to, just to, to give them a little edge as they try to fight that inflammation. Thank you. All right. 
We will still pause for any last minute questions. Please feel free, we have plenty of time. So please feel free to, to bring them in. Um, I did put in the chat while we're waiting for questions that there are some upcoming sessions um, over the next month or so. We have four, we have another great session coming from Dr. Okoye in October, October 20th. Um, we have a question. How often does a biopsy of suspected drug rash help or is the histological uh, usually nonspecific? Good question, Randy. I think it's actually pretty helpful most of the time um, because often when we are biopsying a drug rash, we're trying to determine if it's a drug rash or something else. And if we do the biopsy and we see eosinophils, then we know that it's more likely a drug rash. The other way that a biopsy can help is, unfortunately, in the first day or two, some of these rashes look very similar. So a maculopapular drug rash, something that looks like a maculopapular drug rash, could become dress syndrome a few days from now, or they can develop blisters a few days from now, or they could develop pustules like you would But if we biopsy it, even on day one or two, we'll see signs that are pointing us towards one of these different types of drug rashes. So for most patients, it's helpful. For a classic maculopapular rash, I think we can stop the medicine and watch them for a few days. And as long as they're, if they're not getting better, then we biopsy them. And then I see uh, another question here. What rate of increasing the dose of amotrigine is associated with the increased risk of rash? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know that the rate um, or even the dose of lamotrigine always matters. Uh, in general, these drug rashes are idiosyncratic. And so it's really hard to predict. Uh, so so not, not that I know of. Um, so there's a question here. Any suggestions for improving the image when sending a photo of a rash from a photo consultant? Yes, thank you for that question. We, we really appreciate when we get good photos. I think the first thing is to get really good lighting. Um, as many lights as you can put on in the room, especially if you can get external light in the room. Helps. I think it's a good idea to take a picture from far away. So we could see the distribution of the rash. One thing for me to see a couple papules on the chest, but it's another thing if I see that the face is involved as well, the arms are involved, and to see sort of a pattern on the body. So you take one further away, you take one up close of, of uh, say a body part, and it's even more helpful if you go in really close to like one of the lesions um, and just tap on the phone and it'll sort of focus in on the lesion and take a, a, a photo there. Um, I think that's that's it really. Those are the three. I think lighting is the most important piece. As is most pictures. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Oh, oh, just say thank you so much for the helpful information. I think this was fantastic, Dr. Clay. We will just pause for another couple of seconds, minute, just to make sure there's no last minute questions. But again, you can see the upcoming sessions in the chat box. When you close out of this webinar, there will be a, a quick survey. This uh, session doesn't um, have CME credit, but we do appreciate your feedback and we like to share that. Um, there's just a comment. Speaking of technology, I think Apple AirPods are noise canceling and distort the audio. Oh, thank you. Oh, forgive oh, me. Yeah. Usually, yeah, in a better position, but uh, this one couldn't be avoided. I am wearing noise canceling headphones, but hopefully it wasn't um, too bad. We have another question. What advice do you give a patient with a true penicillin allergy who diagnosed regarding future and oh, you diagnosed regarding future antibiotic uses? Cephalosporins? Uh, no, so actually the cephalosporins can cross-react with the penicillin. So if they have a true penicillin allergy, then I would recommend that they avoid the penicillins and as far as possible avoid the cephalosporins as well. Um, we we find that for many patients, they just kind of grow up caring that they have a penicillin allergy. And so for people who really need penicillin for whatever reason, let's say we're trying to treat syphilis or something, we can actually send them to allergy to get to actually be tested for penicillin allergy. And if they do have it, they can get desensitization um, therapy if they don't have another option. But for the most part, we have other options now for the penicillins. Thank you. All right, well, I am going to uh, 
stop the recording. Thank you all for joining us today. And Dr. Clay, thank you so much. I know today had to be stressful with un unpredicted circumstances, but we appreciate you being here so much. So thank you. Thank you for um, having a big